It's good to see everybody here tonight in our midweek, midweek service, in our, our midweek class, and it's uh, good to see everyone. If you're visiting with us, uh, for, uh, with us uh, we ask that you fill out, a, fill out a visitor's card and place it in on the uh, welcome desk as you leave and stick around a little bit so we can get to know you a little better. I do have a few announcements. Um, Susan Carver, she had a good report on her leg. Uh, there's no blood clots and no blockages, so that's, that's good news for her. And, uh, but she, she's also sh showing signs of congestive heart failure, so we need to pray for that. Joe Null is home from the hospital. He will be me meeting soon with a surgeon about the heart valve issues. And Bob Rager's sister, Frankie Lauer, will be buried on Friday, May 6th, with a family service at the cemetery in Covington, Texas. Our Northwest Bible School sign-up sheet deadline is tonight on the Northwest Family Board in Hall A. Classes for this session will begin May 18th. Admission printing is Thursday at 10 a.m., our monthly door knocking will be this Saturday at 9 a.m., so please make plans to attend. We had a pretty good crowd last time, but I think we can do better. Um, so make plans to, to, to meet at 9 o'clock this Saturday. Uh, have your picture taken with your mom on Mother's Day in room 23, 23 Hall C, after morning worship. I think that's a neat idea uh, to have a picture made with your mom. Um, graduation Sunday will be Sunday, May 15th. If you have a senior in high school, bring your decorated trifold to the office this week and, we'll, and we will display them in the foyer starting on Wednesday, May 11th. Uh, contact J.J. Hendricks for more information. Uh, the Northwest Youth, don't forget to sign up for all the activities that are going on which are found on the uh, youth board. Uh, it's going, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on this summer, so don't forget to sign up. And last but not least, Kevin Kimes' doctor follow-up was a great one. Uh, there, was, there was no detectable cancer cells found, so let's praise God for answered prayers on that. So um, our song leader tonight will be Dwayne Nall. Opening prayer, George Carmen. And invitation will be from Daniel Lester and our closing prayer from David Robinson. So let's uh, worship the Lord together. Please go ahead and mark your hymnals for the invitation song, number 907. Please mark 907. Now turn to number 467, number 467. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps us so steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep. In the Savior's love, it is safely moored, will the storm withstand, fortress well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables passed from his heart to mine, can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure 
while the billows roll. Crash into the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore, so pass forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep. In the Savior's love. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to have an anchor to hold on to that our faith might stay firm and that our understanding of your will might grow and that we might become better and stronger in sharing the message of salvation to those who've never heard. We pray, Lord, that we will, as a congregation, be strong in our uh, desire to meet together and to worship together and to work together and to share the good message with uh, those in Bible classes who come on Sundays and Wednesdays and and we're just so grateful, Lord, to be a part of this group of, of believers. And we ask that you will bless us as we go through this, this service tonight. We also want to uh, pray for those who are ill, who are uh, having different kinds of health issues. And we've heard, uh, heard some good news uh, concerning uh, the cancer that uh, is no longer apparent with, and my mind's gone blank, I'm sorry. But Lord, we're thankful for uh, the fact that that cancer has been removed and things are looking well. Lord, we want to pray tonight for uh, everyone that is ill at home and those that have lost loved ones, and we pray that this will be a good time for us to contact folks, telephone them or visit them, and encourage them in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening. You have to bear with me. I've got a cough in the last few minutes. In a few moments, we will stand and sing a song that is meant to be an invitation for anyone that needs to come forward. If there's anyone here tonight that needs to put Christ on a baptism, then we would love nothing more than to do that tonight. But usually it's just one or two of us in the building on Wednesday nights that might need to respond to that invitation of baptism. And like I said, I'm not leaving you out. But for the most part, the focus of tonight's invitation is the rest of us here tonight. And it's meant to be kind of in three groups, kind of towards the younger people, the middle-aged people, and the older people. And I was going to look at that by dissecting our career path and our path to heaven. In our career path, we start off kind of young. I can remember back in high school uh, going into the counselor's office and talking about what I wanted to do in life, if I wanted to go to college or whatnot. And then when you're that age, you decide and decide you'll get pressure from every which way on which college you want to go to or if you want to go to a trade school or go directly into the workforce. And then finally, time goes on and a lot of work passes and you finally land that big job, that big your career you've always wanted. But the work doesn't stop there. You keep working and you work hard and you try to, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You try to increase your value. You're ambitious and you want to move all the way to the top, maybe even become the boss of that company, which is all good. And then eventually after years and years and years of hard work and dedication, then comes retirement. Finally, no more working or at least no more working for that job or that company. You finally get to relax. 
But where's God in all of this? If we kept God in our focus throughout all these years of hard work and dedication to our jobs, if we've been just as dedicated to God as if we have been to our careers, if we showed God the same ambition as we have our work, our career. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in it, go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Do we have that same ambition for that path that we have for our career path? Do we show as much ambition to serve the Lord? We should. The word serve or servant, what does it mean? And are we being a servant? Does the Bible give us examples of what, <clears throat> excuse me, of what a servant is? God himself tells us what he considers to be a servant. In 2 Kings 10.10, 10, he says his servant, Elijah. 2 Samuel 7 and 5, my servant, David. Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, my servant, Moses, is dead. So we see God's, <clears throat> excuse me, we see God's qualifications for his workplace. But are we preparing ourselves for that as much as we are in our careers? Do we live up to God's criteria? Young people, prepare yourselves for your future, yes, and prepare to provide for your families. But more importantly, don't get sidetracked. Prepare yourselves more than you do for your career. Prepare yourself, prepare yourself to serve your Lord your God. Make Christian goals for yourselves, but don't just make the goals, achieve them. Be a Bible class teacher. Be a preacher. Live now to prepare yourself to be a deacon or an elder when you're older. Be a servant now. Be a worker now. 1 Timothy 4.12 4, says, let no, man <clears throat> excuse me, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in the word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, faith, and purity. We sing that song in VBS. I won't try to sing but it's, it goes something like, I want to be a Christian firefighter when I grow up. I want to be a Christian police officer when I grow up, which is all well and good. I think we should add a verse to that that says, I want to be a faithful Christian when I grow up. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose you this day who you will serve. For me and my house, who will serve the Lord. As young people, you need to make that decision now. So to the middle-aged crowd... I'm going to hold on to that title as long as I can. Uh, life can be overwhelming at times. We get caught up in things. But are we making time for God? Are we, still taking, are we still making God our top priority? Or is he getting pushed to the back burner? Are we studying to show ourselves approved, 2 Timothy 2.15? Or do we find ourselves in the same place as the people being rebuked by the writer of Hebrews? Chapter 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again in the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Ouch. Think of that verse the next time you feel like the preacher is stepping on your toes because they were definitely getting their, sto their toes stepped on. If we're not serving the Lord by this age, we should be by now. If not, why not? When will you? What are you waiting on? If you feel behind in your studies, well, then get to it and start studying more. Now, with all due respect to the older, more retired crowd, in Proverbs 16.31, it says, The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. I hope our older members are enjoying retirement very much. I can't wait to get there. Or maybe you're getting close to retirement. But the Christian never retires from the, surf of, from the life of serving God. 
I will give a couple examples, one bad and one good. At another congregation, some years back, the elders asked Jennifer and I to help out to recruit some Bible class teachers. That was like pulling teeth, except we didn't really get any teeth. Um, we got a lot of excuses. I don't really think I'm good at that. I'm too old. I'll leave that for the younger people to do. Let's not be like that. And my good example, I'm not for sure. I didn't write anything down for this. I'm not really sure how to word it. Uh, and I asked permission before I did this. But a good example of not retiring from your Christian life is our own brother, George Carmen. To see him walk, sometimes you, and I do mean this in all, all due respect, sometimes you worry that he might trip. But I hope he never stops walking up here to, to lead us in prayers or teach classes because it encourages me every time I see him do it. The other day I talked with him before class, and uh, I can't remember his exact words, but he was describing to me how bad his hip was hurting as he was standing there about to teach class. George has put together one of my favorite Bible classes I've ever been a part of on Wednesday nights, and I would say that Wednesday nights is probably right now my favorite day of the week. And Jennifer always talks about how excited I am uh, when I come home from my Wednesday night class. That's a good example of not retiring from Christian life, and hopefully... We never will. Hopefully we never retire from Christian life. And if you've never really began your Christian life as far as putting God first and truly being a servant, then what better time than now to get your priorities straight and put God at the top of your priority list. If you need anything tonight, why don't you come together as we stand and sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus falleth tenderly on your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, but obey, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke, his hand is on you, lay light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor, and are heavy laden thee upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy, and I will give you rest. Dear help be with those that because of health reasons can't be with us tonight. We ask that you will bring all of us back at the next appointed time. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good evening. So good to be back tonight. I get to start off class with a little piece of humble pie. Uh, last week, as I was trying to express that, you know, we need to not be so critical, I diverted down a path that's, that said if you're not 
physically up in front of people, you don't have a right. Apparently my brain wasn't in gear while my mouth was in motion because there are people that do wonderful things behind the scenes that we never see. The whole point I was trying to get at is maybe we should try not to be so skeptical. And I think that that is a, a, good, point to be, a good point to be made is uh, we need to look for the good. Does anybody remember the movie Pollyanna? So let's, let's try to look for the best in others because a critical word can really disappoint someone, especially if it's something they're not used to doing. So I could start off class with an apology. Uh, I'm sorry that I, that I didn't portray myself as well as I should have and got a real good brother that pulled me to the side. And it's like, you realize you said this? No, I didn't. He goes, yeah, you did. You said da-da-da-da. I'm like, oh, I did say da-da-da-da-da. So here we are. But we're going to continue on with our study tonight. I appreciate your patience with me. We're going to be covering Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, which are some very fun books to study. The book of Galatians could all, is also referred to as the truth of the gospel. There's a good chance that it was the first epistle that was written from the hand of Paul. We find that uh, the audience was the Galatians with both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. So when we look back to the, the, who the Galatians were, they were descendants of nomadic warriors who left Gaul, which would have been Central Europe. In the 3rd century B.C., they first invaded Greece and then migrated into Asia Minor. They established permanent settlements in Central Asia Minor. And then the last king of Galatia uh, bequeathed his realm to Rome and it became a Roman province in 25 BC so when we consider the Galatians these are a people with a you know a rich history and we find that they're a, they have a diverse history so what we are getting in this book is are things that are addressed to both Jewish and Gentile Christians so when we look at the book of Ephesians which we're going to get to here in a minute no less than four or five times does Paul talk about how there's one body. And here we see him preaching just like that, like there is one body. So when was the book written? Some suggest between 48 A.D. and 58 A.D. The later date is if he was in Rome imprisoned and he would have wrote it at a similar time to the, as the prison epistles. But uh, the early date which uh, I kind of lean more toward, would make this the first epistle written. And we find the language that he uses is great for Christians. So Galatians is a really interesting book. Uh, what we find is that uh, after Paul went to Acts, Acts chapter 16, they were joined by Timothy. Uh, it was after this that Jewish teachers came from Palestine to Galatia. They questioned as to whether Paul was an apostle. We find that happening, as we talked about last week in 2 Corinthians. So we find people, when they can't attack something that you're teaching, what are they going to do? Find little things. Find little things to try to make big deals out of. Remember what we talked about last week? The, the, the detractors in Corinth were saying Paul wasn't a very good speaker. Remember I compared that to Abraham Lincoln, who uh, you know helped stop slavery. He uh, you know, helped heal the country, but he stuttered when he preached, or spoke. He didn't preach. When he spoke. So his detractors would go, well, he stutters when he talks. Look at what he's done. Why are we reverting to that? So we find these Jewish Christians wanting to force Galatian Christians into Jewish practices, like trying to force them to be circumcised or, or things of that nature. So we find that they weren't quite ready yet to give up Judaism. Why do you think they weren't quite ready to give up Judaism? It's a rich history. They were God's people. It would be very not palatable to all of a sudden the people that you looked down on for centuries to be equal to you. So to try to keep some sort of power, we find these Jewish teachers coming in they taught that Christians must, in effect, become Jews in order to be saved. Paul learned of this false teaching, and due to his inability to visit the church immediately, he wrote to them, and we see that in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 20. So scholarship, as I stated, is divided on when it was written, but we see here that why was the book written? Because the gospel was being perverted by Judaizers. So the perversion here wasn't a sexual perversion, 
It was taking what was good and twisting it to something that was bad. It was taking something that was true and twisting it to something that they got their own desires to try to bring Judaism into New Testament Christianity. And when we cover the book of Hebrews, we're going to see there's no place for Judaism in Christianity. Everything about Christianity is better than the law of Moses. Everything is. And I can't wait to get to the book of Hebrews. And because that's, if we were going to name Hebrews something else, I'd just name it better. Because everything about what we get to do is better than what they had under the old law. So it doesn't make sense that they wanted to pull, pull this forward. We see Paul's discipleship being denied by these false teachers. If it was possible to under, undermine his apostleship, they could undermine his teachings. Paul defends himself with several statements. We see if he were interested in pleasing men, he would not be a servant of Christ. His gospel was delivered to him directly from heaven. He gave up his status in the Jewish religion to follow Christ. We get into that in the book of Philippians. He had been called by God from his mother's womb. On his two visits to Jerusalem, the apostles and elders made no changes to his gospel, but rather extended the right hand of fellowship to him. We find that Paul was preaching the truth actively, and they wanted to deny that he was walking with God. They wanted to deny that he was teaching the truth. So they tried to undermine him. Do we see the same thing happen in the church? You ever see somebody get crossways with an elder? And when they can't find something legitimate to get crossways about, what do they try to jump to? Ignorant stuff. Well, he doesn't wear a tie on Sunday mornings. I, I, you know, I, I don't like that uh, he does his shopping at Walmart where they sell alcohol. But don't you go to Walmart where they sell alcohol? Yeah, but I'm not an elder. You just get into petty nonsense. And what people are too ignorant to realize is people see through it. When you're bringing up such tiny, petty arguments, they realize you've just got it out for somebody. So what we need as Christians to do is what? Be honest. You know, strive to get along. What does the devil want the most from our congregation? He wants us to fight. He wants us to fight. We don't need to fight. We need to find ways to get along. We see that he withstood another apostle, Peter, to his face. Peter was in sin. And Paul confronted him with it. To his face. That's the kind of, kind of guy Paul was. Is that the type of people we're supposed to be too? Yeah. But how do we do it? Ephesians 4.16 says we share the truth in what? Love. We share the truth in love. We need to understand who we're talking to. We need to have that sort of relationship. I'm pretty tight with Kevin Dunsworth. I love that guy. Who doesn't love Kevin Dunsworth? Amen and amen. And, if I, and, uh, and TP loves him too. But if Kevin came up to me and said, J.J., I'm kind of seeing something you're doing, and it doesn't go with Scripture. Can we look at that together? If I have an honest heart, what am I going to do? Well, let's look at the Scripture. I want to be right with God before I want to get in a fight. But if you walk up to somebody you don't know, and you're like, listen, dummy, you're doing it wrong. What are people going to do? going to ready to throw hands. I had a, a minister friend of mine who was in his office studying and so, a preacher that he'd never even heard of called him and said, I've got questions you need to answer now. And he went, I don't need to know you, clunk. We need to be people that are receptive. And even if somebody comes up to us and is rude, I still need to assess that. I had a, a gentleman... When I first got into ministry, that got mad that something happened to one of his kids. And since he couldn't get mad at anybody else, guess who he got mad at? He got mad at me. I wasn't in the vicinity. I had no say over what was happening. He just realized he could spew his venom at me and started questioning if I even had a heart for ministry. And, I mean, I'm before I went to preaching school, and I'm just kind of like, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I need to go back to football. And luckily, one of the preachers there goes, don't listen to him. He's mad about his kid. 
he said, think about what he said, apply what you can, but, you know, try not to focus on the nastiness of it. So, the only person that I can control is who? Me. I can't really control my kids in a, in a, in a brainwave type way. Tonight, Elias was bent down in the pew, stuck upside down. I had to go over there and pull him up by the trousers and get him sat back down in his seat, and everybody was laughing that saw it. But if, he, but if I could control him with my mind, what would I have done? He, he would have been sitting there like a little gentleman, and he does most of the time. But the only person that I legitimately can control is myself. I like Jared Hudson, and I haven't asked him if it's okay if I use him as an example. Is it okay if I use you as an example? It's a bad thing to ask since I done started. I won't do it anymore. But if Jared Hudson came up, and he is a kind guy. Jared is a very kind person. And he politely said, hey, man, I've got a question about this. Can we look at this together? I don't see Jared as the kind that's going to be like, hey, stupid, you said this in class. Because if he did, what's likely to happen? Even if I don't want to, I'm going to get defensive. Even if, I, even, if the, even if I'm trying to hear, I'm going to get defensive. So we need to be kind to one another. We need to follow the example of Paul because some people say kindness is letting people do whatever they want to do. And that's not kindness. That's not love. If somebody's in sin and we're not trying to help them walk the straighter path, we're letting them stroll all the way to hell. So if we say, well, you know what, I don't feel like I've got the relationship with them to talk to them, if it's somebody that's here at Northwest, develop that relationship with them. Find a way to work together with them. Find a way to get to know them. Find a way to understand them. And that's the type of body that we should have here at Northwest, is trying to get to know each other and love each other so when times of error do come up, we're able to patiently work and deal with each other. We look at the book of Galatians, there are many things that we can see. We find Christians are not under the law of Moses. We find the purpose of the law of Moses was twofold. Man is under law today, even though it's not the law of Moses. So the, pur uh, the purpose of the law was to, uh, to show discipline and sacrifice to the people. It was also shown as, as a separation from the Gentiles to bring Jesus into the world to uh, fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham. We also see that it's possible for a child of God to fall from grace, chapter 5 and verse 4. There are many of our denominational friends who will say that once you're saved, you're always saved. If that was the case, Paul is a liar. If that's the case, the Hebrew writer is a liar when he wrote Hebrews 10, 26, and 27. We see that you can drift away. We see that you can fall away. We can see there's no more forgiveness of sins. So the once saved, always saved might be comforting, but it is not biblical. We find that a perverted gospel cannot save. When somebody says something like, all you have to do is take Jesus into your heart as, his personal Lord and, as your personal Lord and Savior, that is perverting the gospel because that's not what the Bible teaches. We need to be a people who teach what the Bible says. And if I'm going to teach what the Bible says, what do I have to know? What the Bible says. I need to be a student of the book. So that way, if somebody strolled in and tried to say, oh yeah, there's going to be a rapture and Satan's going to rule for a thousand years and Jesus is going to reign after that. I mean, if somebody comes in with that, be like, no, that's... If I don't know anything, I can go, well, that sounds like a lot of fun to watch. And, uh, but if I'm studying my Bible, I'm like, now wait a minute, we never see Jesus step foot on this earth again. We're going to be called to meet him in the air. So we need to be diligent in our, in our studies we see that works of the flesh lead to eternal condemnation. We find the fruit of the Spirit should be seen in the Christian life. Not just exercised on Sunday mornings, but exercised daily. We find that a man reaps what he sows. We find spiritual blessings in Christ where man gets, that man gets by baptism. We see in Galatians chapter uh, 3 and verse 27 that, it's that that's where we put on Christ is with baptism. So there's only one uh, body of doctrine that must be obeyed. And that's why I love being a member of the New Testament church, don't you? I love being a member of the New Testament church. I got one nod. Everybody's happy to be a Christian, right? We're awake. Am I not being interesting tonight? I'm very interested, but I may not be parlaying that. Uh, is we need to be excited that we are New Testament Christians because this is all we need. This is it. 
And if we needed more than this, Paul again is a liar. Because 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete and equipped for some good works, a lot of good works, or for every good work. 2 Timothy 2.15 was to study to show ourselves approved, be workers who have no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We have a responsibility. And I love being a member of the New Testament church because if anybody asks me a question, I just turn to the Bible. I don't need a creed book. I don't need a catechism. I don't need anything like that. All I need is the Word of God. And it's the same Word of God that we all have the same access to. Now, does anybody in here use King James and King James alone? Why, no, nobody? King James is a good translation, as Spencer taught. I use the ESV. Other people use the AS, uh, ASV of 1901. Anybody use that one? Because I want to shake your hand. That one's a challenge. That one's difficult. But when we look at the different translations of the Bible, we find the same truth but we have different learners, different styles. If I had grown up with the King James, do you think that I would have probably clung to it a little bit better? Yeah, I never. I grew up on the ESV. So, uh, and before that, I have no idea what I grew up on. But when we look at this, there's only one body that must be obeyed. and th There's only one body of doctrine that must be obeyed, and that's what we find in the Scriptures. One who tells us the truth is a friend rather than an enemy. The, the good brother that stopped me after last week's class and said, Hey, man, what you taught wasn't right. I consider him a friend. I consider him a good friend to, to come to me and tell me that. At no point when he was talking to me did I sit back and think, This guy's my enemy. I better find a way to undermine him. No way. I listened to what he said, and there was merit to it because I value his opinion. So when, we, when somebody tells us the truth, we need to realize they are a friend and they are not an enemy. We see that man is saved by faith that works by love. What is love in the Bible? Agape love that we see from God is an active love. Man is saved by faith that works by loving action. And some people will say baptism is a meritorious work to earn salvation. Absolutely not. Acts 2.47, we see that it's God that adds to the church. I didn't add myself to the church when I put on Christ in baptism. He added me to the kingdom. Fantastic. So when we see this is my faith allowed me to believe and to obey. And that's what it does with us as well. We see benevolence is to be directed at all who are in need as there is opportunity. Uh, it is a sin to bind where God is loosed and loosed where he is bound. Sometimes we view the spectrum of uh, Christianity as ultra-conservative and ultra-liberal, and we find them far apart. But that's not true, is it? It is a horseshoe. You've got the ultra-conservatives and the ultra-liberals right here, and what they have in common is neither of them respect the Word of God. Because you've got one side binding that you have to drink from one cup, or you're going to hell... That's not meant to be bound on us. What did Jesus bless? Was it the literal cup or was it the contents of the cup? The contents. If it was a literal cup, we're, li we're, we're in the wrong part of the world. We need to be lining up around wherever the Holy Grail is. But, or whatever. But what we have to consider the contents were blessed. They did it in an upper room. How many congregations that hold to that opinion have an upper room in their church building where they can take their Lord's Supper from one cup? They don't. It's a consistency issue. But they are binding something that is not meant to be bound by the Word. That doesn't respect God's Word. Now, could we drink from one cup if we wanted to? Gross, but yes. We could share one cup. Paul Matson, I love you. I don't want to drink after you. I don't think you want to drink after me, do you? Good, I'm glad you said no. But uh, we have the freedom to do that if we want. It's the contents of the cup is what is blessed. I prefer individual cups. And to truth be told, I prefer the little tear-up things that we do that we've done for the past two years. I never want to go back to seeing somebody picking their nose and then tearing off the bread and then it gets to me and I'm like, ugh, I don't want this at all. 
So I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. <laughs> And that, 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 that kind of grosses me out. But that's a me thing. That's not anybody else. I wouldn't bind it on anybody else. But let's go to the liberal side of it. They loose what is not meant to be loosed. Oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Worship God how you want to. Let's add instruments. Let's add praise teams. You know what? Let's l allow women to preach. You know what? It doesn't really matter. As long as we've got a good heart about it, and as long as we're sincere, then that's okay. Neither respect the word of God. So what you often see is ultra-liberals jump to ultra-conservatism, the ultra-conservatives jump to ultra-liberalism, and it's not because it's a spectrum, it's because it's a horseshoe. We have to respect the Word of God. And if I respect the Word of God, what am I going to do? What the Bible tells me to do. So, we see that the, the child of God must be willing to rebuke those in error. I think I've beaten that one to death. But it says, do so in a spirit of gentleness. I know some preachers that they're gentle like a bull in a china closet is i mean they, they I'm, I'm just telling them how it is brutal honesty or casual cruelty you gotta pick well i'm just you know i'm just bold no you're a jerk if we're going to go to someone we do it in a spirit of gentleness why do we go do it in a spirit of gentleness Isaac Enriquez would have the answer I liked. He would always say, because that's what the Bible says. So if I ever say Isaac Enriquez pertaining to class, that means it's time for somebody to say, because that's what the Bible says. If the Bible tells us to go in a spirit of gentleness, what should we do? Go in a spirit of gentleness. But what if somebody won't repent? That's where you start pulling in Matthew 18. You go to your brother. You hope you win them over. If, they, if you still don't, you go with witnesses. And if they still won't repent, that's when you take it to the church. And it's not, yes, we're going to get rid of them. It's not that at all. It's, I hope that the loss of fellowship is going to make them see the reality of what's happening. Is that they are in sin and that missing, the missing of fellowship will go, wow, they're really serious about this. I really need to look at this. And the hope and desire is that they return. That should always be the hope, is that they return. But we have to do it how God said to do it. Uh, the, that whole mindset, oh, I just told them how it was. You mean you told them you didn't love them? If you're just going to be out and out rude to somebody because you're, uh, b because you're bold, you know, or, uh, I mean, we beat this point uh, to death already, but we've got to be willing to rebuke. But we also need to be willing to be gentle with it. It's only when the fly lands on our forehead do we realize that it's not a good time to use the hammer to kill it. So I bet William liked that one. Don't hit yourself with a hammer, buddy. It's not going to be good for you. We also see that Peter erred on the matter of doctrine. Therefore, he couldn't have been the pope. Popes are supposedly infallible. And if, if it was okay for him to sin... And then Paul would have been wrong for rebuking him. And if, if Peter wasn't infallible, at what point does the Pope become infallible? I remember about 10 years ago, one of the Popes stepped down, and he had to change his uh, Facebook status from infallible to it's complicated. I've got two laughs, I'll take it. That's a little bit of a Facebook joke there. But we see that Paul confronted him. And what we learn from that is what one does affects others. The choices I make affect others. Now, let's consider 1 o'clock on Sunday. Some people view, well, I don't really have to come back. I've already worshipped once. But what if there's somebody that looks to you to cheer you up? And I'm not saying the people that live in the boonies. If y'all live far away, you live far away. You go home, tag your front door, and don't get to eat lunch and come back. I'm talking about the people who willfully choose to say, you know what, I just don't want to do it. I just want to watch football. What about people that rely on you to be stirred up to good works? Hebrews 10, 24. And the question would be, would it be appropriate for me to just not come back at 1 o'clock? There's three out of the four weeks. I'm not doing anything. I might lead singing once, but I only speak, I only preach once a month. And that's at last one o'clock. Would everybody think it was okay for me to just go, I don't want to come back. And if the answer is no, why is it okay for other people? I'm not paid to be here at one o'clock. That's not what it's about. Even if I went back to football, I'd still be here at one o'clock. 
We need to strive to be faithful because we don't know who looks to us for guidance. It's embarrassing that we'll have 225 people on Sunday morning and 50 show up for 1 o'clock service. We've got to do something. We've got we've to realize that we have a responsibility to one another. Robert pours hours and hours and hours into his sermons. And he's ready to deliver one of those sermons at 1 o'clock and we have 45 people that have come back. What, what message do you think we're sending to him? And again, I'm not talking about people that live far away or people that work or anything like that. Only you know your heart. If you think I'm ganging up on you, I'm not. Uh, I know some reasons why people don't come back. I'm solely talking to the ones that just don't want to. What one does affects others. The decisions I make affect others. The decision that I preach classes upstairs like I do at the school of preaching in hopes to see growth and development of their faith. If I decided, you know what? I'm really tired of that. I just want to play games. And we're going to play games and go slap the whiteboard and you know, play tic-tac-toe or Bible hangman. You know, it's Bible, so it's got to be for Bible class, right? If I did that every week up in the classroom, what do you think would happen? Leslie Autry would skin me alive, be the first one. But what would those kids start doing? My actions would affect them. By not giving them a steady, a steady diet of Bible and in turn just giving them a steady diet of frou-frou and fun, I would be doing them a disservice. We do each other a disservice when we don't, when we're not here, when we're not encouraging those around us. Hebrews 10, 24, we're to stir one another up to love and good works. Let's move on to the book of Ephesians. I don't know if we're going to get to Philippians or not. The book of Ephesians is one of four books commonly referred to as the prison epistles. The church is set forth as the body of Christ in Ephesians. My favorite passage that talks about this is Ephesians chapter 2 because he talks about the two bodies which would have been the law of Moses and the law of patriarchs. And now there is one body, and who is the head of that body? Christ is the head of that body. So if we're going to be a part of that same body, which we are, then the brain, if, if my body works properly, and my brain says, do jazz hands, and I do jazz hands, my brain's working properly. But if my brain it tells me to do something and my body doesn't work, there's a problem. And we see that with so many places is they're not letting the head give the signals. They're doing whatever they want to do and expecting God to just, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So we see at least four times, maybe five, that, that, uh, that Paul talks about the body of Christ. The individual singular body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in you all, or in all. We see that in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. Paul wrote the book, widely accepted by early scholars, and he says it's from him. The vocabulary is similar. Who was it written to? It was written to the saints in Ephesus. When was the book written? Between 60 and 62 AD when Paul was in prison in Rome. So lessons we learn from the, uh, the Ephesians is we see salvation is by grace through faith. Our denominational friends will add alone in, the, in that verse. And you've got some people say that I'm saved by grace alone. And some people will say I'm saved by faith alone. And then the people that are bad at math will say I'm, I'm saved by grace and faith alone. But we see that we're saved by grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. And we're saved by grace through faith. And what is faith supposed to be? It is active in obedience to God. If I truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if I truly believe that God raised Him from the dead, if I truly believe I need to change my life, if I truly believe those sorts of things, I am still saved by grace through an active faith. Ephesians were saved by grace when they obeyed the gospel. We see that they heard in chapter 1, verse 13. They believed in chapter 1, verse 13. We see in Acts 20, verse 21, that they repented. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 8, and again in chapter 4, uh, in, uh, chapter four verses 4 to 6 here in Ephesians, we see that they were immersed. They are a fantastic example of what we as Christians need to do today. If we want to be like they were, we have to do what they did. And, and luckily, it's very, uh, very clear for us to see. 
We see lessons from the book of Ephesians. There is only one church. 1, 22 to 23, chapter 4, 4, chapter 5, 23, chapter 2. In order to be saved, one must be in the church. Remember a, a lesson that I did, I guess it was two years ago, that talked about the cities of refuge. If, if, uh, if I, the example I used was if, if my donkey accidentally kicked Elliot Blagg in the head and killed him, Tucker would have the right to come kill me back. Because remember, the old law was an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But if it was an accident, I've got to run to a city of refuge, not just any old city I want to go to, but I had to run to a city of refuge. And when I was in that city, I was safe from the avenger of blood. The parallel that we find is there is safety in the church. When I step out of the church to do what I want, that's where I run into a problem. Let's say I could either go to Hebron or I could go to Jerusalem, a little bit north of that. I'm like, well, you know, I really like the architecture of Jerusalem. Tucker could come kill me. Because Jerusalem was not a city of refuge. Hebron was. The only way to find safety was in a city of refuge. The only way we find safety today is in the church. The church is part of the eternal purpose of God. To be saved, one must live faithfully. They can't just utter a prayer and then be good forever. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. So let's look at the book of Philippians. Unique things about Philippians. Paul mentions himself more in this book than any other. In Christ Jesus is found eight times in this book about relationships. The key word in Philippians is joy, even though Paul was in prison when he wrote it. You know, we look at Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, and there's a song that we sing about it. But let's break that verse down a little bit. Rejoice where? In the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Our joy is to come from God. Our joy isn't going to come from earthly living. It's really hard for us to teach that when we live in this society, isn't it? Our bills are paid. We're never hungry. It's like when Amos was preaching to Israel. You know, Amos was from Judah, one of the minor prophets. And he's saying the Moabites are going to get God. The people in Judah, they're going to get God. And the Israelites are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, y'all need to repent or you're going to perish. And they're like, what? They didn't like that at all. And they're like, why do we need to repent? Look at us. We're healthy, we're happy, we're rich, we're wealthy. What happened next? Assyrian captivity. So the thing is, when we have to look for joy in Christ, it's going to take more effort on our part than it does for those who live in third world countries that fully and totally rely on God. We have a lot of distractions. People are all worried about Disney right now. And they're worried about Disney and you know, Disney's going to take our kids away. No, Mom and Dad, you already let the devil take your kids away with travel ball. You already let the, the devil take your kids away by schoolwork. Whatever you have put, whatever it is that you put before God is an established priority to your child. And when they leave the house and don't grace the doorway of the church again, do not, and I repeat, do not look at me. I've done everything in my power to teach upstairs. That, that bulletin board is full of activities that they can grow spiritually and grow in their bonds with one another, but I can't undo parenting, and I'm not pointing that anywhere here. It's in my life of ministry. Is you see parents make bad decisions, and then their kids fall away, and they want to blame somebody else. It's like, how about the dozens of times that they skip church because you wanted to sleep in? How about the dozens of times they had a ball game and you decided, you know what, they're on the team, they need to skip Sunday morning services. That's even more prevalent in today's time than it was when I was a kid, but I grew up in a little town in Arkansas, so we still, we still had people wanting to, wanting to do what was right. But we have a responsibility to find our joy in Christ. In Matthew 6, where do I have to put God? Number one. And it takes effort to make God number one. It shouldn't, but it does. Who wrote the book? Paul. Who was it written to? The Philippians. When and where was it written? Same as Ephesians. Rome with Paul imprisoned there the first time. Lessons we learned from Philippians. The plan of God for church government is for each congregation to have qualified elders and deacons. That is the plan. That's the blueprint. That's what he desires. Are there times where congregations don't have men who are qualified to be elders? Yeah. There are times, but it shouldn't be for 50 years. We need to make decisions today 
with our young men to train them up to be good deacons, to be good elders one day. We need to, we need to make decisions today that 10 years from now that, 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 that Northwest is going to look back and go, wow, I'm so glad that they made those decisions. I'm so glad they put those things in place. I'm so glad they encouraged people to serve and to grow. There is a reason that Christian is to rejoice even in, ver- in adversity because the worst thing that can happen to us is what? Death. I haven't picked on Dwayne Nall tonight, so let's say Dwayne's upset with me about it. Why haven't you picked on me? I love Dwayne Nall. So Dwayne comes up and just bashes me with a baseball bat right in the temple, and I die. Is that more than I can bear? Yeah, it's more than I can bear. But if I'm right with God, where am I going to spend eternity? Heaven with God. Now, if if Dwayne walks up with the bat and says, I'm going to clock you with this unless you say, Hail Satan, and I go, ah! hell Satan uh, I don't want you to hit me with a baseball bat it would be much better to live a short life in faithfulness to God than a long life and be told depart from me I never knew you we have so many people that want to hear well done good and faithful servant and they're not good they're not faithful and they're not servants we need to strive to be the best that we can be and that's why I say what I say about this is we should always be trying to grow We see that the child of God must be set for the defense of the gospel. Therefore, we need to be knowledgeable about the Bible. We find the nature of Christ is taught in Philippians. His deity, pre-existence, equality with the Father before coming to earth, his incarnation, his humanity, his atoning death, his exaltation. The church has a responsibility also to support missionaries. (laughs) We got that one down, don't we? We have our own in-house missionary. And I've never met a man like Spencer. Have y'all? Spencer's amazing. I mean, I think he gets his oil changed every 3,000 miles. I think that guy's a machine. He's got to be. For all the work that he is able to get done, I respect and wish I was more like Spencer. But we do a great job at Northwest of supporting missionaries. And that got us through class. Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, I appreciate y'all giving me the floor to teach as well as allowing me to apologize for my... uh, misspeaking last week. I hope that this lesson has been edifying to you, and uh, I hope that this has been a battery charge to get you through the rest of the week. Thank you.